You mentioned the fourth industrial revolution. What, what is that? So the fourth industrial revolution, it's, it's a concept that's advanced by the World Economic Forum, and that's sort of the, the Davos crowd, uh, transnational global capital. And it is this future that is imagined for the world that is um, largely based on, it's a digital world, um, it uses Internet of Things, sensors, so that, that we have um, the way in which we interact with the world is digitally mediated, artificial intelligence, um, increasing use of synthetic biology and bioengineering. So literally, um, you know, I talked about us being commodities as data, but literally being potentially re-engineered at the cellular level, um, which I believe is also linked in with these to the mRNA vaccines that are backed by Gates, which are also bioengineering, which has like real concerns about eugenics. Um, and robots and automation. So, you know, when we were talking about sort of key dates and things to think about, like when I say that this, this has been at least in place since the late 1940s, is this idea of the, the Massey conferences and cybernetics and Norbert Wiener and, and human computer blending. And, and Norbert Wiener was sort of the father of cybernetics and AI who um, actually was a, a brilliant man in, in philosophy and mathematics and was almost like a human computer. Like he, he calculated trajectories for um, uh, missiles, you know, in the Second World War, like in his head. Um, but he was very thoughtful. And, and by the end of his life, he realized what had happened. Like he realized what they had created and the implications and the implications of widespread adoption of robotics would lead to enslavement of humanity. Like humans cannot compete with robots on many of these tasks. And he started to speak out and was, was soundly criticized for it um, by these institutions that wish to advance it. But now we are very much getting towards not just robotics, but also um, platform labor, telepresence labor, um, avatars and digital you know, there's humanoid robots, there's other kinds of robots. There are all of these manifestations of digital work um, that are taking place that are further marginalizing human beings doing the work. And that's what clearly we've seen with ed tech in schools. That's what we're seeing with telemedicine and healthcare, um, teletherapy and, and social workers. Um, so the fourth industrial revolution is about this sort of seismic shift. And essentially, to me, it feels like it's about dispossession from the world and a, and a wholesale clearing even further of the commons to the point that um, people may, not, may no longer even have full control of their bodies and their mental states <laughs> in this world that is planned by the fourth industrial revolution. And it's being planned by the telecommunications companies and the finance companies, um, these sectors. And so humans will be sort of redundant, like the billionaires, I think, would sort of like to imagine a world that's mostly them and like their class and the robots and like a few people, <laughs> batteries to keep the AI going, <laughs> like to feed off their data. <laughs> like it really is like the matrix is sort of where things are headed. Um, so there's like a new center for the fourth industrial revolution that's based out of the Presidio in the Bay Area. Um, you know, and I was watching a talk by Robert McChesney, um, it was from like 2016, where he said even then they had gotten into Davos and were listening to these talks. And like everybody in Davos is like, oh yeah, it's like in a few years, like we could actually automate like all of our factories around the world, but the middle class would burn. So we're trying to figure out what to, how to navigate that. Like we could do it, but what would happen if we did it? And so what I'm seeing and have been seeing in the rollout even in Philadelphia, which is a city of a lot of poverty already, is that like we've seen increased high-tech policing, we've seen more and more surveillance systems, more and more social control systems. UBI is kind of, I believe, the thing that's gonna try to keep the lid on the pot, you know, keep it from boiling over, give people a little bit so that they don't totally rebel. But like once we have the facial recognition, the gate recognition, potentially automated policing, weaponized policing, weaponized drones, weaponized you know, they have those police robot dogs, they don't have weapons on them at this point, but they're using robotic policing and security, private security to um, enhance 
human policing so that like the robot will know where you are so that the human person or the drone can come get you. Like, so there are many of these things that are, have been rolling out in preparation for knowing that this dispossession is happening. And right now, like that's why it feels so frustrating to be disconnected from humanity, disconnected from our fellow human beings because we can't properly even prepare for this. And, um, you know, it's just really disconcerting. So you said you used the word dispossession. You want to talk a little bit more about that? Because I'm, I'm interested in, uh, you know, some of these underlying concepts of like, you're being given something, but at the end of the day, we are being dispossessed of, yeah. of, our, of our agency yeah. and our liberty. And do you want to talk a little bit about that? So one of the thinkers that has like really influenced me a lot recently and I think really speaks to this time is Silvia Federici. And um, she, her research was a lot about the, like the clearing of the commons and then later um, attacks of, of women um, around like land-based practice and pushing people off of the land and pushing them into factories where they could be controlled. And, and then she actually brings her analysis up to the present day and World Bank and structural adjustment and attacks on like indigenous women protecting lands um, throughout the world and, and being again painted in, as witches in new ways. Um, and so I think this linkage of taking things that we share collectively, um, pushing people into systems of how they live that wouldn't be their choice to take away that autonomy, um, to set the terms under which you can live, like just feel really, like they're all in motion right now. Um, and I think one of the things that frustrates me a little bit in listening to some of these the backstories of what's happening now with this, you know, this shutdown is the presumption that work is bad. Like that, that having a career is something we don't, like we'd really just aspire to not work. You know, I think it's more complicated than that because I, over the past 10 to 20 years, the gig economy has turned the, what people do to earn money to live into more and more brutal situations. So I, I understand that many people are forced into doing work that is not satisfying to them, that's very oppressive. And we need to like take that very seriously and, and, ad and address that element. But the other thing is, is that there are, there are, we should aspire to a world that we can be productive contributors in whatever way that we have our personal talents that helps self-actualize us. And some of that is around like caring for our communities and caring for our families and caring for each other. And that doesn't necessarily like manifest in just sitting on a couch. <laughs> like maybe that manifests in teaching or healing or building things or creating um, generative spaces or growing things. Like there should be ways of being in the world that we can participate in physically and with our brains and continue to grow that may be linked into an economic value exchange system like that are part of that. But to sort of say that we just don't need to work and we should all let the robots do all the work and then sit around, I think is a pretty naive understanding. Like, I mean, I think we all have a pretty good sense that people who maybe have careers that they've found satisfying have a real trauma when they retire. <laughs> Like when that is taken away, when that part of your identity is taken away. So that's what I'm grappling with in this fourth industrial revolution is I don't really think that we want the robots as teachers. Like I don't really want a nano pill instead of a doctor. Like maybe there are people who love that. And, you know, at this point I sort of, because I realize this whole agenda is moving forward in a bipartisan manner, um, like... I will just frame my background as more communitarian anarchist at this point, like, cause I think the whole system is, is broken, but like we should care for each other, but we should have autonomy. We should have an option to do things that give us satisfaction within a larger understanding of our community context. And um, the robots really worry me. So if folks wanna do the robot thing, like maybe there's a part of the world that you can go do the robot thing, <laughs> but you're doing the robot thing shouldn't preclude everyone else from having some other options. And that's where I feeling like that we're at now is that we're at the, on this trajectory that Google and Amazon Web Services and Palantir and these folks are sucking up 
our data and our humanity. And they're going to decide for us that um, we'd rather sit on our sofa and have a Kiwi bot robot deliver us a burrito to our door. And we don't have a choice in that. And that's not, I don't, I think that's a terrible future. Humans like ice cream. <laughs> no. Ice cream. <laughs> that video was amazing. It's was terrible. Um, a couple of things that came to mind when you were saying that. One was um, the, the enclosure laws. I don't know if you've looked too much into that, but and I want to I want to do more research on it. But just that idea of enclosure, it just it creates an image of, 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 you know, and I know it was about pulling people off the land and pulling them into the cities. And have you done much research on enclosure, the enclosure laws? Not deeply. I mean, a lot of it is around like reading Silvia Federici's work and understanding that. Um, I guess my, my, my forte is sort of wide. <laughs> Maybe not super deep in any one thing. <laughs> well, you, but we, like we pulling on a lot of different... Yeah. Um, you need to have that. Just, that's the problem what I have with a academia is it's so compartmentalized. And that was you know one of the things I found interesting about Aldous Huxley was he was really about multidisciplinary... And he was attacked, you know, by the specialists. They said, you can't be speaking on this. We, this is all we do is study this. Yeah. And he's saying, but you can get a perspective when you can connect what th this, you know. That's what so I do. So he was yeah. a big promoter of the multi. multi there's a documentary about him that kind of goes into his conflicts with, with um, other specialized, you know, specialists. But see, and that's like another sort of currency, right? Like I've got my credential, I, my reputation is more valuable than yours. And, and I think that's what I'm trying to get at is this alternate worldview is not about domination, like I'm more expert, but is about a collective knowledge web. And that, that shared knowledge that can be applied is much more what we need in this moment than people who have certain very particular knowledges that are locked away and exchanged in very prescriptive ways. Like that's, to me, I have very little use for that at this point. I see our current situation on this sort of verge of techno dystopia is part of a historic continuum that's based in racial capitalism. Like that's, um, it's based in, in what we've done to indigenous people and black people and through enslavement. And that we need to acknowledge that. And that we need to like find the people who come like in that acknowledgement from a point of like liber collective liberation. That, that if you understand this, if you're on board for collective liberation and you're not hurting other people, your goal isn't hurt other people, like we can build the thing. And the identity politics piece of things that is really so intense in social media right now is that it, it's so polarizing and fragmenting that nothing can come together. And like the people that I've connected with, a lot of them are moms and we're across a broad spectrum of political persuasions. And um, I have to say like my child identifies as non-binary. Okay, like that's my, and I love them. Like they have my full support. Um, I was asked to participate and share information with um, a group of like a women's movement that was connected with um, Latter-day Saints. And they said, you know, and I said, well, listen, if this is sort of where I'm coming from, if, if, if you support, you know, me as a mother in, in this, and I think I'm happy to share my information. And they were very affirmative, like, yes, that's great. Like we acknowledge that, we accept that. And so I feel like being willing to put your, your values out there. Um, I don't feel like I should police other people's faith systems if you're coming at things that you're not hurting other people. Like if you're, and so that's where I'm at right now is trying to, in all of these boxes that, infinite numbers of boxes of collect, you know, <laughs> variations of boxes that people can be put into is like, where are the people fighting where are the people, I won't say fighting because I'm trying not to be militant, but like who would advance a liberation point of view of, 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 and not strictly just liberating people, but understanding like people as part of larger natural systems and like to make this better world balance. And if we can bring those people together and tap into some of that sort of metaphysical power like is a counterbalance to 
the cybernetic power. Like, I think that's where the hope is because to play by their rules, like to, to, to go up against US empire and global finance and technology and Palantir, like on their terms, that's not gonna be a very good fight for us. So we have to find another way to advance a worldview that is counter to that. And we have to be willing, I think, to both um, be vulnerable and like be very clear about our values and put ourselves out there that what our values are and then and to see where it resonates because surprisingly it resonates in some pretty unexpected places for me and that's what I have come to learn over the past year is that when you open yourself up and you say this these are my beliefs who other people think that this is our would be on the same track as this the people who step forward are the people who you would think it would be your allies I, I have not been my allies and the people who have stepped forward have come from unexpected quarters. But well, the thing is, a lot of people don't know the history. Like, they don't know. We're not taught it. Like, we're not meant to know it. I mean, I'm, I'm a white, middle-class woman with a master's degree. Like, if I hadn't come into education in a public school system in a district that serves many low-income people, like, there are people with whom I have made common cause and, and, and developed friendships with whose paths I never would have crossed because society isn't set up that way to really have chances for meaningful engagement across, across class, across race, uh, as peers and friends. Um, and I'm really grateful for that. I mean, it, I fell down this rabbit hole. My life would be very different if it wasn't for the Philadelphia Public Schools, but, and, and so it goes. And so, um, you know, now I'm like, you know, poor people's army, right? Like, I think being open, so I joke around with some of the other moms, I'm like, we have like open bandwidth. <laughs> Um, but if you don't know the history, like you don't know what you don't know, I'm to this late. Like there are many people who are far more schooled in leftist politics or da 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 than I am. Like I, my background is art history and historic landscapes, <laughs> right? Like it wasn't political economy and technology, but I had to learn it to understand what the world is hap was happening in the world. Um, so, I don't know. Well, if you're not an expert, you don't you shouldn't be talking about any of this unless you've got the degree that specifies I've got no badges. I got no badges in any of this badges? stuff. Badges? <laughs> we don't need those sticking badges. I think there are many aspects to the situation that we're not meant to know. Like we're not meant to have all the facts because having not having all the facts leads to more speculation and more friction. For me, all, I had done all of this research about the fourth industrial revolution leading up to this, and I never would have figured that pandemic was going to be their trigger moment to make all of this rollout happen. It wasn't anything that was on my radar at all. But clearly, once they started reading like the World Bank stuff around pandemic bonds, it was pretty obvious that there were whole markets set up in advance of pandemic to take advantage of the situation. Um, I mean, I think this crisis brings to the fore a lot of sort of larger issues of control, safety, privilege, thoughts about life, what is the meaning of life, how do we deal with death? <laughs> like there are many things that are packed into this that when we get in these online discussions, like the, the gray area falls, at, falls away. I mean, I think we would all like to feel that we're in control of having a good life. <laughs> and, you know, and, and that's something that like as white people, like we feel like we're, you know, like we're used to having that. Like many other people in the world are not used to having that. So I think in many respects that may be feeding into some of this dynamic. Um, the stakes are super high on getting this industrial revolution thing in place, like around the world. And it's very clear that governments around the world have been very invested in biological weapons and synthetic biological weapons and printing viruses, synthetic biology viruses on computers. Um, to me, to think that at some point governments wouldn't decide to use those technologies against domestic populations to accomplish the end that they want, you know, I feel like it's a possibility. I feel like there are no guarantees of safety. I think people would like to roll back and feel like if they did all of the right things, then we would be safe. And I think there are probably like 
the black community, you know, Latino, like there are many people who just know it's not safe. Like there are no guarantees of safety in the United States. Um, you know, that said, I'm not trying to be cavalier about all of these things, but really trying to look at the data. And I think what we're seeing rolling out with the fourth industrial revolution is data driven. Everything is data driven. Um, government is data driven. Society is data driven. It's all driven on data, but data can be used to different ends, depending on what data you use, how you collect the data or don't collect the data, how data is compromised or not compromised. So I think it's highlighting all of these issues around data analytics and the power that data analytics have over society, both in very specific policy ways, but also just even on our mental states. Um, because two people can look at the same thing and interpret it very differently. Um, so, I mean, that's where I'm at. I'm not, we don't know. Like there are many aspects of this that we don't know, but at the same time, what I would say is under these conditions of extreme hardship that are advancing the fourth industrial revolution and, and cons further consolidating power in ways I think are gonna be, have long-term negative consequences, we have to look out the other end and say like, when are we going to say it's okay to come out? Because I think from a mental health standpoint and economic standpoint, there's tremendous trauma that's happening um, that can't be discounted. And from hearing them talk about it, it sounds like the plan is waves on waves of this, that this is the new normal, is facing pandemic. And whenever things get out of hand, that that's the card that can be played, whether it, it's, a, it's a pandemic in actuality, whether it's a, a natural situation, or whether it's something that is engineered by a political entity to a certain end. And that's just how it is. And it's kind of awful to have to think about it. But um, Well, I think a lot of people have a hard time thinking of their leaders or thinking of politicians or business people or, or you know philanthropists as having any ulterior motive you know they can imagine some foreign leader being this horrible person but they can't imagine someone you know of their own color or their own nationality or whatever i don't know it's it's very bizarre to me like that people can't grasp that there's something else going on well i mean there's a huge mythology of America, right? <laughs> For some people. I mean, the, about, yeah, just what we are, like, and what America represents. So, um, like, when you start to peel back, it's not all rosy. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I mean, if you look at the money, like, for me, money and power, they're the same thing. You just, you follow the money. And I, I think that many, and this is where the fourth industrial revolution in Davos is so key, is that I think, you know, you always hear the two wings of the same bird kind of narrative, but truthfully, these programs are being advanced by powerful interests who have enough money to buy both sides. And they'll brand things and frame things differently, but they bought both sides. Google has bought both sides. Jeff Bezos has bought both sides. And I think I'm not a psychologist, but you know, I do sense that there are ways in which people who are within that apparatus justify things to themselves and compartmentalize things. And I've found in, in terms of like people who like won't take meetings with me, like they would prefer to have plausible deniability about what's actually happening. If no one comes and tells them then they can say they didn't know when the, when the time comes of what was really going on. And so that's why I feel like my little job is to run around with my half sheets of paper and say, I know what you're doing. <laughs> it's bad, don't do this thing. Like I may not be able to stop it, but I can at least like eliminate the plausible deniability piece because I say, listen, I showed up to testify to tell you that this is what's happening, poverty committee. Goldman Sachs wants to turn the poor into data commodities with pay for success finance and digital identity systems. And the NAACP, the national NAACP has issued a resolution saying that is a bad idea to link digital identity, blockchain to digitize public benefits. Not just me, it's the NAACP. So there you go, let me add that to the record. So you all know, you're on notice that when this comes, that someone said it was not okay. And at this point, like it's very hard. I'm mostly a sole operator with the exception of like a couple dozen other moms because we don't fit any mold. 
Like we can't go reform party A or party B. The Davos people are the ones, the trilateral commission, they're the ones who are pulling the strings and you can't get to them. I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't resist, but like you, that's, they're not, they're not touchable by an electoral process. Getting one or two more city council people who you think are going to be on your side doesn't really, that level of reform doesn't touch Davos. And what we're up against now is this brutal progression in, of biocapitalism that's coming on with like drone robots yelling at you about social distancing and the robot police dogs in Massachusetts. Who is stopping that? Nobody's stopping that at this point. So it's going to have to be people organizing outside of existing parties, I think. It's not going to be an election. If you're sitting around running around knocking doors for an election, like, I got to tell you, if it was going to be fixed, it would already been fixed. So can I, just as a background around the human capital markets. So this idea of wealth being concentrated in a small number of people, and then you have lots of poor people. And it's almost like a plumbing problem. Like capital has to circulate in order for the system to keep going, like for growth. For people to continue to make money, capital has to flow. If it gets locked up, the whole system falls apart. And that's why, you know, even after the last 2008 crash, everyone's like, still spend money. Because if you stop spending money, the whole system falls apart. Okay. So... To keep the money flowing, that's why we have to turn the poor into commodities. And the data structure for that, and this is to channel transnational global capital. So these are the 2,000 of the world's largest asset holders, you know, BlackRock, Blackstone, UBS Bank, Deutsche Bank, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, all of these players, Vatican Bank, Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund, all of this money is locked up and it needs a place to flow. And we're, we are reaching a point in which the general population did not have liquidity or buying power to, to keep that going. So that's why this shift has to happen in terms of turning people into these gambling commodities. So then the rich are playing amongst themselves this gambling game over who gets the more money. That structure rolls through the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which may seem like to make not much sense. Like how does the UN connect to impact investing? It connects very directly. Two thirds of the 17 sustainable development goals are about poverty. There are a few that are about water and carbon and climate, but it's only like four or five of them. The rest are about public private partnerships and about education and health and smart cities and justice and all of these things about managing populations. Okay, so those were passed in 2015. The Global Impact Investment Network was set up like 2007, 2008, right around the crash. And that was getting everybody on board for metrics, impact metrics for social impact. Okay, they're connected. So that's 2008 or so, Judith Rodin and the Rockefeller Foundation. With the B-Lab, they got everybody set up with the metrics now to play their game. Then 2015, the, uh, everybody signed up for the UN Sustainable Development Goals, okay? And we're thinking climate, but really it's a little bit of climate and a lot of poverty. So then there's something called the Impact Management Project, which is these 2,000 largest asset holders that are gonna channel their capital into fixing the climate and solving poverty, okay? Because that's the apparatus, that is the plumbing to keep the capital moving when the poor can't buy anything, okay? That's the new model, the new economic model. And this is largely backed by uh, Open Society and Soros. It's called the Institute for New Economic Thinking, and he's bought thousands of economists all over the world at like $50,000 a pop. Open Society has to like set this, this new economic system up. So it's all tied to the UN SDGs. Number three is, um, I believe it's number, number three is health and number four is education, okay? They have said to make the impact markets work, it all has to be mediated digitally through ICT, individual communication technology. So that's phones and tablets, okay? So all of the UN SDGs, ironically, are supposed to be channeled through digital devices. Why? Because they need the data for the impact investors, okay? Like if you teach a kid something, but it's not on a dashboard, does it count? Well, it's not going to count for UBS Bank, so it all has to be on the dashboard. And so what we're seeing in terms of the shift to everything digital is to capture that data, to justify it for these. And it may not be fully online yet, 
but it's normalizing it, okay? So these, the way in which you have playlist education, it's not because that's better education, it's because it's better data collection for these impact markets. So I know much more about the education side because I was tracking ed tech for a long time, but healthcare is the other huge piece. So the nodes of sort of data collection on people are education and training, skill building, um, healthcare, and healthcare also includes mental health and it also includes like addiction treatment um, in that. And then supportive housing. So that's like housing for people um, and services around their housing for people who are unhoused. Those are the three main areas of data collection. So what we've seen with this lockdown situation now is all of a sudden, at least two of these major industries that are connected, health and education, are all platformed. Everything is online. School is closed. No more school. Probably never more any more school unless we wear like hats with pool noodles on the top or something. I mean, it's ridiculous. Like, and so as I was studying this for the last five years, this model is called the learning ecosystem. And it's supposedly, I guess, when we go out that you don't have bricks and mortar schools anymore. You just, um, it's like Pokemon Go education. Um, you bump around and earn skill badges like the Girl Scouts or the Boy Scouts and it goes into your learning locker that later you can be, the AI can profile you for a job. But you learn through projects in work-based learning settings and you go to the rock gym and earn a badge and you go places in your community but it's all under surveillance and you do this instead of school and then most, most of it's online. And for high school kids you would just have a cheap Chromebook and again, it's all consumption, it's creation. You can't really make much on a Chromebook. You can just consume and be consumed. Um, and then the little kids would be in these alternative settings like the YMCA and the Boys and Girls Club. And this has all been set up for at least the last 15 years, this infrastructure as after school programming and summer school programming. And I was always thinking, they call it learning ecosystem. It's out of knowledge works in Cincinnati. And I was like, how are they gonna close all the schools? I was like, you know, I'm telling people, this is coming, this is coming. And they're like, we can't see it. And I'm like, how are they going to close all the schools? Like, who would ever do that? Me and my husband, he's like, they're, no one's going to close all the schools. Well, yep, <laughs> didn't see pandemic coming, right? And so now we've closed all the schools. And then the conditions under which in some places they're reopening schools are so horrific, it's like a prison. So people don't want to send their kid back to school. One, either because they don't feel safe because of health concerns, or two, they just think it's brutally awful. So there you go, like that's the education piece, is pandemic leveraged essentially the learning ecosystem rollout once we're allowed out with our QR codes to check in at all the places. Um, and this is tied in with blockchain vouchers, education vouchers, which will be these ESA student savings accounts. Um, I mean, the other thing that we've seen too is telemedicine, which is not, um, I'm not as deeply immersed in the medical side as the education side, but clearly the same situations were being set up in medicine um, with electronic health records and um, the Affordable Care Act and standardizing medical care, standardizing all the healthcare codes, normalizing telemedicine. Like that has all been in the works for some time. Um, IBM and Google working on AI analytics around medicine in other places, places with socialized medicine that they could get the big data sets. Um, so that's already like now, you know, you can hardly see a doctor, right? You have to be screened through the telemedicine protocols. Um, I mean, the other piece on the supportive housing is that there are many people that despite, you know, restrictions put on evicting people now and sort of postponements, there's a very clear sense that a lot of people are going to probably be dispossessed out of their current living situations, like in the next year. And while there's a lot of organizing going on around immediate, like don't evict these people today. Um, and that's what I was trying to convey like within the past year with like the tenants union and more socialist housing organizations is that it's not just about the people, like we need to understand this pay for success infrastructure within supportive housing because eventually that's the next frontier. It's not just keeping people in affordable housing situations. It's, we have to take on this affordable pay for success housing, where essentially, and a lot of these housing, um, supportive housing programs are run through religious groups. So essentially, um, you know, the Vatican Bank is very deep into a lot of this. In Philadelphia, Project Home is the lead person with pay for success finance. And so then the question becomes, if all of a sudden, 
large percentages of people have to access housing through pay for success deals that are connected ostensibly through faith-based entities. God forbid you get associated with one that isn't aligned with your belief system. Like, what does that mean? Like in order to like not be on a street, like, and you probably won't be able to be on the street because the drones are after you. Like you have to comply with a belief system that may not even be yours. And then someone is getting kickbacks because this is the new human capital commodity scenario. There's huge ethical questions that we should be asking. And the other piece of this, um, there are, there's a model, Santa Clara County, California is the incubator for a number of these early phase pilot programs. There's a pre-K one called um, Strong Start, I believe, an early literacy one. Um, there's one for mental health and there's one for housing. The housing social impact bond is called Welcome Home. The Welcome Home social impact bond. These deals, these pay for success deals, are overseen by a third party that assesses its success or not, according to the terms of the contract. The Welcome Home Social Impact Bond, the third party assessing the data is Palantir. So Palantir is Peter Thiel's company that maintains um, contracts with ICE, Department of Homeland Security, and predictive policing contracts. Okay? So you're unhoused in Santa Clara, maybe you have someone in your extended family who's undocumented and now all of a sudden your access to housing, your data is run through Palantir because someone structured it as a global financial market. I mean, and in that, one of the investors in that deal was the reinvestment fund, which is based in Philadelphia. So you're essentially turning people's basic human needs into global investment markets and, and conditioning that on a level of surveillance that's tied into a very clear predatory police state apparatus. And very few people are talking about that yet, but that's gonna be the aftermath of this COVID situation. What happens when your housing is predicated on a health status, right? And you leave for the day and somehow like somebody that you were in touch with two weeks ago changes your QR code and you can't get back in your housing. Like these are all things that are probably very technically possible now. They're not just, they're not perhaps scalable or socially acceptable. And that's what I keep saying. There are these pilots that are in place that, that should they become normalized, should they become scalable, will have profound implications for humanity. And Silicon Valley are not our benevolent overlords. <laughs> They're just not. Yeah. Uh, do you want to, did you talk about the digital, uh, digital ID? Uh, you know, just, uh, have you, did you want to talk a little bit about that or is that something you've kind of delved into? Yeah, so, um, so the whole concept of human capital data commodities depends on, and also smart cities and internet of things, is that essentially there's one portal <laughs> that aggregates all of the data on how you interact through technologies um, in real time. And, the, the, and these items are connected on, it's called a self-sovereign identity system or decentralized identity system. Um, often people are looking at blockchain as the mechanism, although I don't think it necessarily has to be on blockchain. Um, and this premise that significant, that you accumulate assets, right? And these are assets that are maybe outside what I'm saying, like currency, like a digital asset could be your birth certificate, your marriage certificate, the property you own, your certifications, your credentials, academic or otherwise, your health status, um, your voting records, your health records, all of this data accrues in one place. And what they will say, the, what the, the privacy people and the data commodity people, like you have control over your data. Like you can use it however, you can unlock whatever part of data that you want. But MIT has developed something called Enigma, which allows querying on encrypted data. So it may not be personal um, PII, like personally identifiable information, but in aggregate, they can use and tap into that information for their impact deals. Um, so digital identity systems have been prototyped through, um, again, global aid. There's something called ID2020 that is connected to the United Nations and I believe it's Microsoft and Accenture are the enablers and the Rockefeller Foundation is part of it as well. 
Um, and I know a lot of folks on the conservative side of things sort of point fingers and say, the globalists, watch the globalists. I'm like, we're the globalists mostly. <laughs> like the globalists are Microsoft and Accenture and Deloitte and KPMG. Like, the, 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 like there are many globalists that are embedded within the United States. Not exclusively, but we have to understand that like when we're looking at the United Nations. They're not a benevolent entity at this point. Um, they've had long-standing ties to the Rockefeller family for years and years on the Trilateral Commission. So they're this apparatus. But ID2020 is, is one of the systems that was used to track um, refugee populations. And they will, the, they will pitch it by saying like, oh, you need to run out of your house in the middle of the night and you don't have your papers. Don't worry. Once your retinal scan is on file, we'll just, you'll just take it wherever you go. And like literally what they're setting up is when I talk about like programmable money, they're doing their benefit, refugee benefits, tied to retinal scans, biometrics, in, in places, like, in Scandinavia, like the Syrian refugee population, so they pay for their groceries with a retinal scan, right? Well, how convenient until you get labeled a dissident, right? Like, and, and then once they have that biometric data, there are whole issues about it being hacked or encrypted, like if it becomes misused, um, you don't get that back. And that's like you, that's not just a password you can change, you can't change your biometrics. So these systems that have been refined through um, aid packages are now finding their way back into the United States. So um, Michael Bloomberg is a key player in smart cities and smart policing and impact investing through Bloomberg Philanthropies. Um, he has underwritten and he owns like owns, but he's donated significant monies to mayor, thousands of mayors of mid-sized cities around the country and the EU and India um, to get on board with data-driven government. And they backed a project in Austin where they were assigning um, blockchain identities to unhoused people. Again, ostensibly so that they could keep their medical records on a QR code. Um, but that opens them up to become these impact commodities. Um, and now, there's a lot of blockchain work going on in Austin. Um, that project evolved into something called MyPass, which is connected by the, to the Roberts Woods Johnson Foundation. Um, it just so tur turns out that QDX Health, which is based outside of Austin, it's between Austin and San Antonio, like that company has developed blockchain health passports. So like I, I haven't made a direct link between the Bl Austin homeless blockchain program and QDX Health. But very clearly, once you have a digital identity program set up on blockchain, having a health component like would plugged right in, I mean, seems the next logical conclusion. Um, so these, these systems are underway. And like I, I had mentioned amply, the pre-K identity app. Um, the state of Illinois, not a surprise because Chicago is the futures market, right? Like what we're talking about is human capital commod futures exchange really is what we're talking about. That's why Pritzker, that's why University of Chicago, Chicago Boys, um, this is based in Chicago. The state of Illinois, is they have a blockchain task force where they've looked at all of the options around blockchain. Um, and th there's a, a report that you can look up online, the Illinois Blockchain Task Force project, I think it was 2018, um, where they had a number of thought experiments about how they would use, and this is the programmable money. So no, that, that's useful to think about. So. This hadn't been implemented, but what they did was they were theorizing in a diagram, um, SNAP or you know food, you know money for to buy food on blockchain and what that would look like, and that you would have an individual with a digital identity, you would have a digital wallet that would have a certain, you know amount of access put into that wallet, and then when you used that money for food, and it would probably only be programmed for food, your SNAP versus your housing or your healthcare, um, if you made the right choice, for the healthy choice, it would put money back into your wallet as like a, a subsidy. But if you made the wrong choice, it would just be full price. Okay, so they had like an apple and a hamburger. And so they would say, well, if you bought the apple, we'll like ding you back a quarter because we love that choice. That's a really good choice that you just made there. The problem, and, and there are a lot of people like, that sounds great because people should just be making the good choices. But it, there's no structural analysis because what that is not seeing is that this person may live in a food desert where they don't, they can't get the apple. This person may work two jobs and some side gigs, side hustles, and they can't get to the grocery store with the produce when it's open. 
This person may live in a squat and not have access to cooking opportunities. Like there are many reasons by which the right choice is not the possible choice. And then people say, well, it's just a plus. But the thing is eventually then you're sna this, they will cut it back and then the SNAP um, amount allocated into that system will only suffice through the month if you always make the right choice. Or if they decide that, um, you know, baby formula or, you know what I mean? Like there are things, there are health, you know, corporate health versus, you know, a community garden type thing. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they, they could they could declare that, oh, this, this, um, this vitamin, you know, enhanced uh, processed food, we've declared this to be healthy. Right. You know what I mean? Versus, right. You know, Who gets to say what's the good choice and what's not the good choice? Right. And then, so what, if you look at this diagram, it's very simple. If your premise is there's the preferred choice and the unpreferred choice, you can apply that to anything, correct? You could apply that to a medical treatment. What's the evidence-based choice? That's going to be the preferred choice. You know, and who's who's benefiting from that being the good choice? Um, school curriculum. What's the preferred choice? What curriculum module do you have to pay a surcharge for the Black Panthers curriculum module? <laughs> right? I mean, you know, literally, um, you know, or somebody like who has a different ideology. If you have something outside the non-corporate state, you're going to pay for it, and maybe you're not going to be able to because we'll just put it out of your price range. Um, what if it's a therapy, right? Well, we hear that this evidence-based virtual reality therapy, CBT therapy is just the best. You want talk therapy? We don't really do that anymore, I'm sorry. So when, when we talk about programming money and controlling people and then in the post-lockdown economic crash scenario, way more people are gonna be put in positions of being controlled, ostensibly by the decentralized wonderful blockchain liberation but in reality, it is, in my sense, it feels very fascist. Yeah. Another thing I think about with the, the, the own your own data, um, privacy, you have freedom, is I, I would get into arguments with people about sweatshops. And people would say, well, people don't have to work in sweatshops if they don't want to. They just, these people choose to work in there. And I was like, well, they don't really have a choice. If you're poor and these are the only people that have money, that are willing to give you money for your work. You don't really have, you, you don't have a choice if you, a choice implies that you have other options. Right. And so I, I think that people are going to be in situations where they don't really have any other options than to sell their data or just to, 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 right. to allow, you know. What do you think about that? Well, so, so I try to make a little video myself to try to talk about blockchain benefits and smart contracts and like to conceptualize to how to make it visual for people. Um, and it, towards the end of this, it, this was ide this imagining a warehouse, like full of um, individual lockers of data, like those kind of warehouses where you have extra storage or whatever. And outside of each door, there's a pad that has like real-time data flow about like the quality of the data that's in there. Um, and that you've got social impact investors who can like Maybe they're just robots, actually, with a scanner thing, strolling the halls of the warehouse, like looking for a good buy on data. And if you're, so I sort of envision three kinds of people, data sets. You've got the rich people who never need to sell their data. Like maybe they have a digital identity. Maybe that all this data is being collected on them. They never have to sell their data. They don't care about their data. They can just actually like pull a curtain down on their little, number quality thing because they don't need nobody needs to look at their quality because they're not selling they're not selling anything or it's i'm sure that i'm sure the collection on them is going to be vastly less well they might have their own island like this is my concept is like richard branson out on necker island is probably not gonna have so much internet of things stuff you know his stuff isn't going to be all censored the the you know public subsidized housing that's gonna have lots of sensors on it, everything right um and then maybe you have people who are like Make me a deal. Like maybe I, you know, if if you if I got a good like investment on my data, I could go take that vacation. Like in or you know some maybe maybe that's nice. Or maybe it's like somebody who's making buy, but like their kid broke their arm and they need some extra money to take care of a medical unexpected medical bill. And so and then those people like are just waiting to see like what what can you what kind of deal can I get? But then you have poor people 
who are totally dispossessed, who just like have to leave their door open and just hope somebody finds something worthwhile because they're not going to be able to live without selling the data. And they just have to sell it at whatever price they can get it because that's just how it is. And, and I, I think, you know, that's what we see in Philadelphia is that we have such a high poverty rate. We have so many people on the streets. We have so many people who are, are living through these like economic cataclysms. They don't really have these choices to make. And adding data as a commodity isn't freeing anybody. It's just a new way to capitalize on people's misery, in my mind. Um, I mean, I think what I'm looking for is a world of reciprocity and like right relationships. And that isn't something that is transactional in this micropayment freaking blockchain world <laughs> where everything is calculated, right? And everything is predicted. Yeah. Um, that's not, I think that's an anti-life way of going about things. And that's my personal opinion.